everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Manual Hoist Inspection Safety Webinar. My name is Gisela Clark. I am the Social Media Specialist at Columbus McKinnon Corporation and will be your host for today's webinar. Today's session will build on your knowledge of ASME and OSHA standards and specifications. We're going to review how a, how a hoist operates and we'll cover proper inspection and load testing. Our ultimate goal is to help you gain confidence and knowledge in the inspection and safe use of manual hoists. Presenting today will be Peter Cook, our training manager, specializing in rigging and load securement. Peter has dedicated 15 years to Columbus McKinnon as an engineer, designing engineered lifts, slings, and forgings. He's traveled throughout the world teaching proper rigging techniques, rigging gear inspection, and hoist and crane inspection and maintenance. As I said earlier, we are recording the session today, and the link will be sent to everyone after the fact. All of our webinars reside on our YouTube channel, and as I said, we're going to direct you there with the link. Everyone in attendance will receive um, a link to the recording. In, as I said earlier, we are all muted except for myself and Peter. Uh, so we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A pane on the right side of your page. We'll take five minutes at the end to answer them. And if we run out of time, we're, you're going to get a personal response from Peter. So thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Peter so we can begin. Hello, my name is Peter Cook. And I want to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, I'll get right into it. And like I said, we'll uh, take questions at the end. And if we don't get to everyone's questions, we will uh, get to you via email. So some definition of terms we're talking about a hoist. Um, obviously, it's a machine which is used for lifting, lifting and lowering loads, um, usually suspended overhead by means of a crane, hook, or lug, um, depending on how you want to mount it, whether you have low headroom or uh, you don't really need the low headroom, then maybe you go with just a standard, a standard mount. Um, designated person is a person selector assigned by employer, employer's representative as being qualified to perform specific duties. And these are terms that are used in the ASME standards. Um, a lot of people, we get asked a lot of times, of how do I get, how do I how do I deem the right person for um, inspecting my equipment? And they call it the designated person, um, so the employer designates that person, a qualified person who, by possession of a recognized degree or certificate of professional standing, or who, by extensive knowledge, training, and experience, has successfully demonstrated the ability to solve or resolve problems relating to the subject matter and work. And then you have a competent person, one who is capable of identifying existing and predictable hazards in the surroundings or working conditions which are unsanitary, hazardous, and dangerous to employees, and who has authorization to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. Really what it comes down to, you can, you can do all your wordsmithing here on qualified, designated, and competent, is training, 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 and get more training when you think you're trained. So um, we offer an extensive amount of courses uh, to cover our product, which we'll talk about at the end. So here we're looking. We're going to talk about manual hoist today, and this is what people term as a chain fall. And a chain fall obviously is suspended by an upper hook suspension. Could be a lug mount, or you know, so we can mount it to a trolley. But um, generally, it's a it's a hook. Um, the hoist body. Then we have hand chain, which is non load bearing, um, and then we have the load chain, which is load bearing, which takes the load, and then the lower hook block. So kind of the quick anatomy of the outside of it. We're also going to be talking about lever tools, and sometimes referred to as come alongs used for stretching, pulling, tightening, positioning, and hoisting applications. A lot of people uh, don't realize that a lever tool can be used as a hoist. And um, so it, is, it really isn't much different between a lever tool and a chain fall, except the, uh, the means of raising and lowering. And there you can see the same thing, upper hooks assembly. We have a lever, load chain, directional lever, lower hook block, and then a safety end ring, which prevents the chain from um, coming out of the unit. Typically, how both work, either have a, a lever or a handrail to operate the unit, but a uh, mo majority of the lever hoists and uh, chain falls have what's known as the Weston type load brake. And what you'll see is that you'll have a friction disc, which sandwiches a ratchet and pawl in between, and then a brake hub. And as you raise the load, you're basically tightening it down a pinion shaft, and you're, you're creating a, a solid, basically like a solid gear and it will hold the load via friction and the, with the ratchet pawl. And then lowering, you're creating a very small gap, and it controls the sense of the descent of the load. And as soon as you stop, it will re-engage itself and, and hold the load. So that's pretty much how it, it works. The Weston type brake is, was designed by a 
engineer at the turn of the century called Thomas Weston. So there is thus where we get the Weston break. He was a Yale engineer uh, right around the turn of the century and it's used extensively in hoisting equipment today. So if you can kind of compare a braking civil hoist to like a ball canning jar, if anyone ever seen a ball jar, um, that's how I describe in class. I actually use a ball jar as an example in our classes and, and kind of show with the rope that it, as I tighten, you'll see that the jar will turn in my hands. And as I lower, it will come down and I can, as I stop, it can self-lock on itself. So sim similar to that, if you can kind of picture that, then you know exactly how a hoist works. Okay. Some of the safety standards. We got asked all the time about underhung equipment um, such as chain falls and lever tools. And OSHA really does not have a standard that covers this type of equipment. Um, so we rely on the ASME uh, series. And there's a whole series of ASME for um, material handling. And the ones we're going to concentrate on for today is B30, 16, and 21 for uh, overhead hoist underhung and lever operated hoist. And if you're doing maintenance or a user, you should have access to these and, and order them. Um, they're, they're excellent uh, standards written by today's experts and updated about every three years. Okay? So those are the two we're going to concentrate on. So let's start off with B3016. Um, we're only going to cover manual hoist today, but it also covers electric hoist and air operator hoist. So powered, powered and manual hoist is what the B16 underhung spec covers. Um, and it, again, ASME is a voluntary standard, but pretty much everyone in the industry uses that as their basis to be compliant. Um, and as a manufacturer of the equipment, we make it mandatory. If you use our equipment, you'll you um, abide by ASME guidelines. For lever tools, it's V30.21. Okay, so that's what there's a little another standard that covers it, and they're they're very similar, uh, but we're going to go over the differences uh, today in this presentation. So what does OSHA cover? Well, because OSHA does not have a, a regulation or a law written, they invoke what's known as the general duty clause. Um, and so if there is an eminent danger, they can, they can um, then cite things under general duty. And they may look at things of ASME and say, hey, these are, these are standards out there that you should abide by. Um, they can't really write you um, something that's not in their law, but if it's very dangerous, they certainly can, and nobody wants to get to a, a point where you have to go to a jury trial or anything like that because certainly ASME would hold up in a court of law if you weren't um, up to their standards. And, and so in that case, you're, you're at the mercy of the jury. So we, we tend to use what's the most stringent. And so in this case, ASME is the most stringent because OSHA really doesn't have anything written. So the purpose of the today is uh, to do inspections, and so we're going to talk about that. There's some inspections that need to be done. Why are we doing inspections? Um, we're going to show you what to look for. Um, there's two types of inspections, frequent and periodic, um, and then we're look for, looking for worn and damaged parts. But the operator is what who does the frequent inspections, and they should be looking out for things in between the periodic inspections, which is usually a third party. Um, that does it. It doesn't have to be a third party. Um, the maintenance crews of a particular facility can do it, but the operator should not be waiting in between those intervals. So daily, they should be looking at things and being sure that the equipment is safe. So how often do frequent inspections need to be done? Um, when I teach people, I, I always teach pre-operational inspections. It doesn't take long to, to quickly use your equipment and uh, just operate it, make sure at the start of your shift it works. But how it's written in the standards for normal service, uh, they require a, require it monthly, heavy service, weekly to monthly, and severe service, daily to weekly. And, I, and again, we preach to do it daily. No, no records need to be kept. It's just the operator just kind of looking over things, raising, lowering it, make sure everything's working properly um, to be sure that they're going to be safe and as well as their workers around them. The periodic inspection is a more in-depth, it's an expanded frequent inspection. It's more in-depth, and they're going to look over everything with a fine-tooth comb, and they're going to record it. and have, So they're going to have records kept so that it's on file that it's been done. And, and that has to be done at least annually, um, maybe more depending on severity of service. Hoist not in regular service. We get this a lot. We're not using our we're not using our hoist. So how often do we need to inspect it if it's it's idle or it's really not being used anymore on that part of a plant? Um, so hoist that is used in clay which has been idle for a period of one month more, but less than one year shall be inspected for before being placed. And now you're frequent. And so the other therefore through 
the free operational I'm not sure that is. Um, a hoist that is used in freely, which has been idle for a period of one year or more, shall be inspected before being placed in service. That would be your periodic inspection. So if it goes unused for over a year, you still have to do your periodic inspection. So that would be your written report before you do it. This is pretty much what a frequent inspection is, what an operator would do. Now, some people put, put um, these cards in the operator's hands and check them off. They don't have to do written reports, but it's just a reminder to do them. We tend to, in our uh, training facility, we zip time to our pendant controls and our hoist and, and on our hand, on cones and our hand chains so that we remember to do them before we uh, do any type of training. So it's, it's a good, good practice to be done. If the more eyes you have on something, the easier it is um, to spot things and the safer you're going to have. We have a nice video on YouTube that shows pre-operational inspections, so I'm not going to go through all this, but go check the, the YouTube video and it will go step by step over what a pre-operational inspection should be on our CMCO channel. And it's a, a very good video to do that. So frequent inspections. Uh, check, check the operating mechanisms for free movement. All right. So, so if you have a lever tool, you want to look at the ratchet and the ratcheting. Uh, is it, is it, if there's a plunger on it, does it come out? Does all the, the operating mechanisms work? Are they springing back the way they should? Is, look over the handle, looking for any bends, um, things, signs of overload, cracks in the handle. Check out the upper hook suspension, rotate it around, it should rotate freely, same thing with the lower. Anything abnormal that you can see, you know, these, you know, we're looking, mostly lever tools have five feet of chain in them, so really it's not that big of a deal to look it over um, and you'll be able to find things. The big thing is um, that end ring at the end here, be sure that this is on here, right here, if this is important. Um, last thing you want is to run the chain out of the hoist and as you're doing a your job you may think everything is okay um, and not realize it's not supposed to be there and we've had people in the industry get killed because they didn't know that that was supposed to be there <laughs> so just sitting in this webinar alone you just learned something that would save your life if you were work, work these this is a pre-operational inspection report where rec uh, records are required um, not sure how well you can see it, but it's, you can see it's a detailed step-by-step. -step. You check off exactly what you're looking at. It kind of spells it out for you. And we're going to go over this um, in this man, in this training today or what's on this report. But and that, that would be a written, what I keep saying, written record. This would be a written record report that you would put on file. Okay. So how often to do the periodic inspections? Well, I said at least once a year, depending on the severity of service. It could be more. So normal service is your once a year. It's the, and what is normal service? It's distributed service with randomly distributed loads within the work loan limit. Um, uniform loads of less than 65% of the rated load for not more than 15% of the time in a work shift. Um, that requires an annual inspection. If your severity of use um, exceeds that definition, that's deemed heavy service. So you would want to do your periodic inspections twice a year. And if it's abnormal operating conditions, then you want to do it quarterly. What could be abnormal? Maybe you're working in high heat environments. Um, outdoors is abnormal. Um, so you want to do it more there. Chemical type environments. Um, so anything out of the ordinary really is, is, is deemed severe service. Oceanic environments, there's another one. You know, that's uh, you know, salt water spray, things of that nature. That would be considered severe that you want to look at that quarterly and document everything. Testing. As a manufacturer, we load test our equipment before it goes in, out to sale or to in, or be put in service. And we manufacture things at two times um, the rated working load limit to verify our workmanship. All right. In the field, uh, per ASME, B30, 16, and 21, a hoist with load suspension parts that have been altered, replaced, repaired shall be statically or dynamically load tested. So that's the only time you need to do that in the field is when you replace something. Um, in, Quite frankly, if the hoist is operating fine and during your periodic inspections you're not finding anything ever wrong with it and it's working properly, you never have to do a load test again. Some people do it on a yearly basis. You don't have to. Um, but if you're doing it, great. I wouldn't suggest stop doing it. It's, a, it's an ad you're doing better than what the standard says. But really, if you're only replacing load suspension parts, then you have to do it. Chain is specifically ex excluded because we test the chain for you. Um, if you have a wire rope hoist, the same thing. The wire rope has already been tested for you, so you, you would have to do a load test if you replace it. Um, however, CM recommends if you disassemble a unit and put it back together, 
we do recommend that you do a load test to, to check everything out. Uh, but the definition says only when you replace load suspension components. So what types of tests are there that are acceptable? Though there's a static test, which is basically here you see a picture of a hydraulic test stand, and it's just pulling on it. You're not operating the unit at all, and it's just putting tension on it, and it's verifying that everything can hold the load. And then there's dynamic tests, where you can actually lift test weights. And um, that I kind of like the dynamic test better, because you're doing an operational test and a load test at the same time. And so you're doing two things at once, where after a, a static test, you would still want to do an operational test on it to be sure everything's working properly. But the dynamic test accomplishes both. The test weight that it should see is 125% of the rated capacity. It should not go above that unless you get permission or approval from the manufacturer of that equipment for a load test. Okay, so that, that that's where that's what's stated in the ASME V16 and 21 document. So you can do a load test from 100% to 125% above the rate of load, and that is an acceptable load test. There is no magic to a load test. Everyone you know wants to think there's something special, or how long do you hold it, or what else do you do? It basically you put the load on it, set it back down, look it over, make sure nothing failed during that load test, and be sure everything's okay. Some people will tell you, well, we let it sit there for a minute, 30 seconds. There's no standard or any manufacturer's recommendation that say that. As long as you put that tension on there or the load on there of 100 to 125%, that is deemed a load test. And as long as everything held up fine and, you're oper and then you did an operational test and it worked fine, you did a successful load test. And I mentioned load suspension parts. Uh, what are load suspension parts? Let's define them. The parts of the hoist that are means of the upper suspension, so the hook or a lug mount, the structure or housing that supports the drum. Now, I'm not talking about covers. The actual housing that supports everything, um, that would be, if you had to replace that, definitely would, would have to do a load test. And then, of course, the lower hook block or, or the lower hook, okay? And again, CM it recommends if you disassemble, it's, we recommend you do a load test. Even if you didn't replace anything, you just wanted to look everything over, make sure internal parts were okay, then um, you would, we recommend doing a load test. I, I personally would. So these other parts that we see on the screen here are not defined as load suspension parts um, other than the wire open chain, and I'll get to that. But gears, if we replace gears on it, technically under ASME it's not required. It's called a transmission part. Um, but again, we recommend if you replace something, do a load test. The load brake, believe it or not, our load brake is called a transmission part. And I, I, when I first started learning about hoist in the beginning of my career, that, that was a kind of a shock to me, that you could replace a brake and technically not have to do a load test. Again, CM, we, we, we err on the side of conservative, so we want to see, see you guys do a load test. Um, what about trolley wheels, right? Well, trolley wheels are load-bearing parts, so if you have a hoist that's mounted to a trolley and you had to replace the wheels, you're required to do a load test. Trolley axles, there's pins, those are load suspension parts, you're required. Um, wire rope or chain, typically not required because the manufacturers test this equipment for you. Um, but again, if you're doing it, no, I wouldn't stop doing it. You know, if you if you don't say, oh, we don't have to do it now because we're only replacing the chain. Go ahead and do it, but you're not required to do it. So if you're, what, what's nice about that is if, if you're just re-reaving chain with a hoist in place, um, it may be difficult to do a load test on that unit to get it down and, or to get it to where you can test it. So this um, really helps that situation where you can get around not having to do a load test when you replace chain or wire rope. Peter, is disassembly required on a periodic inspection? That's a very good question. And no, a periodic inspection can be performed with the hoist in place. And then from the inspection of what the inspector is seeing, um, if they deem they have to go any further into the hoist than they should do so. And then once they start going into the hoist, then there's steps to what to look for um, as far as disassembly. Now, the question we get asked a lot is, how often should I disassemble my equipment um, to, um, for, a, for a periodic inspection? And, and the only thing I can give you is my opinion, and this is not the opinion of Columbus McKinnon. I, you know, it's just my opinion, Peter Cook's opinion, so take, take it for what it's worth. Um, you know, is, three to, is every three to four years a bad idea? I don't think so. I think, you know, in my opinion, I would, do, I would disassemble something every three to four years to take a look at it. Some equipment, depending on how it's used in severe environments, you know, maybe yearly. Who, who, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough thing to say when you disassemble that equipment. Um, 
But if you have equipment hanging there and you know it's been there a long time and it's never been disassembled, it's probably time to do it. So you should you should definitely come up with a PM program where you schedule disassembly for the hoist. Lever tools, I would absolutely disassemble every year. Again, that's my opinion. And the only reason I say that is they're easily overloaded and they're abused, they're abused because they're portable. So they get thrown in the back of trucks. They, um, okay. you know, they, they're, they're in the field and you have, let's say, you have a three-quarter ton lever tool and you don't have a bigger tool with you. Chances are you're going to use that tool to do a little bit more than what it should, even though it's not recommended. It's just what's done. So I see those tools being abused quite a bit. And so, again, that would be my recommendation. recommendation. Okay. But what it comes down to, what it comes down to is up to the inspector when to go further. So if, if they saw like overload situations or anything like that, or suspected that the hoist was the hoist was operating funny, definitely, uh, you know, they would have to go in further and check it out. Okay, excellent. And would now be a good time for me to pull out our first polling question? Sure, absolutely. All right. If everybody can look, I think it's on your screen, uh, you should see a polling question. I'll launch it now. And what it's asking you is, how often should a load test be done on a hoist? Yearly, every two years, never, whenever any load suspension parts have been replaced. And for those of you who are connecting with us via an iPad, um, I don't think you're going to be able to answer these this way. So you can just type in your answer in the Q&A pane. Oh, this is interesting. So again, how often should a load test be done on a hoist? Yearly, every two years, never, whenever any load suspension parts have been replaced. And it's looking like it's between the first answer and the last answer. We're at about 2080, Peter. Okay, we're going to give it another minute, another second. All right, 20% think yearly, 80% think um, whenever any load suspension parts have been replaced. Can you go ahead and give them the answer? Yeah, it would be whenever load suspension parts are replaced, and that's per the ASME guidelines. So um, that's the only time you, you're required to do a load test on your unit out in the field. Now, if you are doing it yearly and that's your normal practice, then you're doing better than what the standard says. So I would say continue doing that if, if that would, if that's uh, it's a better program, and I, I wouldn't knock that. But according to ASME, only when load suspension parts are replaced. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. You can move along now to the next slide. Okay. So, um, you know, this here says, well, even though you don't have to do a load test when gears and brakes are replaced, consider what happens when these components fail. If the gear fails, the load comes down. If the brake fails, the load comes down. So um, that's why CM says, hey, if you're going to take these things apart and put them back together, probably a good idea we do a load test. Okay, even though you, even if, even if you haven't replaced anything, you just did it for merely to look it over and be sure everything was okay. All right, so let's go to hoist inspection. Let's well, first thing we're going to look at is is markings, and so we want to know what's the rated load on these units. So that has to be marked so the operator knows what how much they can lift with that tool. Okay, and they should be identifiable from the ground floor, especially for chain falls. Obviously, a lever tool you're holding it in your hand, so you can look at it. You know, be able to easily see it. Identification. So it shall be marked with the name of the manufacturer, model, or serial number. So who made it? CM? Was it a budget? Coffin? Yale? Shawbox? Who, who made the unit? What the model number, serial number is? The warning labels need to be on there, right? And the warning we basically have all these warnings that tell you don't lift your friends and don't overload. And um, you know, if, if without that, it's called failure to warn. And you want you want to be able to the operator to look at that all the time. Um, and again, you've heard of, everyone's heard of that McDonald's thing where someone spilled hot coffee on them and somebody won a big sum of money and now we have to put on their coffee is hot. Well, the same thing with a hoist. You have to warn the user that, hey, doing things improperly is dangerous and it could result in injury or death. And so warnings are, are to be on there. So where you find some of these things, obviously the capacity labels there, you see the markings, the manufacturer's markings, on the lever tool, on the handle, there's warning labels. And it could be just on, uh, like a dog tag on a hook that says, read the operator instructions before using this unit and refer to ASME B16 or 21. That's acceptable if, you, if, that, if that's all you have, because uh, that is telling the operator to do that and warning them that you should do that or you could result in injury or death. So know, know how this equipment operates. So. 
Um, and you can see the serial number gets stamped into these units, so you want to document that. And people can use, you know, some people do use their own serial numbering. They, you know, they have the manufacturer serial numbers, and then they also have their own. That's, that, that's fine as well. But you always want to keep that manufacturer serial number um, to refer back for parts and things of that nature. Hook inspection. Um, hooks are hooks, whether they're on hoists, whether they're on chain slings or cranes, things of that nature. Um, the hook inspection falls under ASME B30.10, so they consider a hook a hook. It must be able to swivel and rotate freely under no load, uh, be equipped with a latch. So on hoists, it's mandatory that you have to have a latch on, on it. So lever tools and chain falls and any type of hoist have to have a latch unless it's a hazardous condition. On rigging slings, it's a gray area, um, depending on what industry you're in, but the, the spec from OSHA and B9 does not require latches on hooks. All right, it's not written in there. And there's letters of interpretation from OSHA and things of that nature that say, yep, yeah, it's not written in that spec. But it's a good idea to have them. Um, so we're looking for any deformation. We don't want to see any distortion, um, any type of distortion. You're going to take it out of service. The throat opening on the hook, 5% to a quarter inch on the throat opening, or what is recommended by the manufacturer. A lot of people get that mixed up with where. Where is only 10%, where um, the throat opening is 5%. Don't mix those two up. People do that all the time. So any wear area, um, whether it be in the saddle or um, in the eye or a pin or things of that nature, if it's 10%, you gotta, you would have to take it out of service or what's recommended by the manufacturer. Okay? And then check out the latch. Make sure it's the right latch for the hoist um, and that it's bridging properly. You know, here's saddle wear, things of that nature. Um, if, you're, if it's marginal and you're not sure, you know, you may want to replace it. Sometimes it's a sometimes it's a judgmental call. You're on borderline there, so you may want to get it replaced. Um, if I were to run across in this this red hook here, if I was doing a periodic inspection and I ran across um, that first picture there where it shows the chain going into it, it's laying on the side. Um, that would alarm me right there, and I would want to do I would want to disassemble that hoist if that's what the bottom block looked like. Um, that show tells me there's been an overload. And I would definitely want to disassemble that unit to look inside to see what's going on um, as part of my periodic inspection because you don't you, you know if that's if that's a pretty severe overload and then you can see um, there's another hook there red hook there where the latch has been taped up and it's stretched out so there's a big sign of overload and they're putting some, either putting something in there that wasn't um, supposed to go in there or they overload it but if I was the inspector, I would ding it out of service and say, hey, you need, to, you need to break that hoist down or send it out for servicing so we can look internally in it. Pins. All right. Um, here, here's the thing with pins. A lot of people during periodic inspections overlook not looking at a pin on a hook. Um, you really can't inspect a pin at all when you look at a hook. You really, you really can't even see it. And we do recommend you drive the pin out and look at it to see if it's worn. You know, it's a judgmental call on the, op, on the inspector whether they do that or not. Um, but in my opinion, it's, it's load bearing. Um, I can't visually see it. And it's, it's down at the hook. It's where the hook's artic articulating. Um, and some of the complaints we get is, well, if I draw, drive the pin out, sometimes I, I mess it up by driving it out. I, you know, I, it, it, it was jammed in there, and I, and I just messed it up. Well, that's kind of the nature of the beast. It, it does happen, and so you put a brand new pin in there. Does that, does that hurt anything? No. Um, but there have been instances of pin failure where it's just never been inspected because it's hard to get out and it's hard to inspect. So um, take that for what it's worth. Pin wear is 10% from the original diameter is what you're looking for as far as pin wear. And there you can see um, what, you know, pin wear on a block right in there that would never have been caught if it wasn't pulled out where that's where the chain was riding in and this is this is more severe on this one here um, and so oops, let me get that uh, there we go so you never know what you're going to find there but that's you know that's holding the whole load it's right near the operator um, so consider consider looking at it Peter uh, can I jump yeah. in now with another question sure sure Okay. Our next question is, how often does a periodic inspection need to be performed for a hoist with normal service? Once per quarter, once per year, once every two years, or once every three years? 
Again, how often does a periodic inspection need to be performed for a hoist with normal service? Once per quarter, once per year, once every two years, or once every three years? 60% of you have voted. Let's get a few more to vote, and then we'll share the answer. It looks like it's a tie. Well, not a tie. I can tell you right now about 20% think once per quarter, 80% think once per year, and a few percent think every three years. Peter, can you go ahead? I'm going to go ahead and close it now. Can you go ahead and share the answer? Yeah, under normal service, uh, a one, once a year periodic inspection is, is required at minimum. If you're doing more than that for normal service, then that's great. You're doing better than what the standard says. You, you don't have to. You typically can get away with once a year, and that's fine that you're meeting, you're meeting that standard. But again, those of you who are doing it more, that's great. I, I think keep, continue doing it because you're, you're making your facility more safe by doing so. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Um, chain inspections. See, all CM hoists are made specifically, all chain made for a hoist are made specifically for a hoist, so please do not put any other manufacturer's chain in our equipment, and that goes for our competitors, too. You want to use the chain they spec for it, okay? Um, the load chain in hoist should never come in contact with anything, all right? It just should be hooked to the hook, and that hook engages the load or engages a sling, um, and, but we should never rig with. The, the hoist chain, and the theory is thinking, well, it's used for lifting, so I must be able, I must be able to choke around a load with load chain. It's not the same animal as rigging chains, or that you could break the chain by doing that. The, the hoist chain is, is much harder than rigging chains, and um, they're meant for dimensional stability, so that because they're going over pocket wheels, especially an electric hoist, they're extremely hard chain um, because they're moving over fast speeds. So you definitely want to use the correct chain um, for rigging, and then attach that to your hoist. So here's how we identify a hoist chain. Um, in our manual hoist, CM manual hoist, they typically use what's known as disc grade. It's a CM braid. A lot of people say, well, what's the grade of that? It's, it's been designed by CM years ago. It's called disc grade chain used in our manual products. Um, so it is a type of alloy chain that we use that's through hardened, and it's specially made for our manual hoist. Then for our electric hoist, we use what's known as star grade chain. Again, it's a, it's a case hard chain. Case hardened chain, extremely hard. We go by the star grade, um, and then in special environments, uh, caustic or clean room environments, stainless steel is what we use. And by the way, if you're going to convert a hoist and say, well, this hoist is now going into a clean room, just don't put stainless, stainless don't go buy stainless steel and put it in there. You're going to need to do other things to that hoist before you do that. You're going to have to call the manufacturer before you go and do something like that if, you did, if it wasn't designed already for that application. And then our import hoist have what's known as a bin grade 80, but don't get that confused with the rigging chains of the grade 80. Um, it just has a strength level of a grade 80. And there's some out there that have, um, let's say, grade 100 chain. Same thing. If it's in a hoist, it's not the same type of rigging chain um, that's used for rigging. It's, it's drastically different. Chain inspection. So look at if it's double reeved, uh, look for a capsized block or any types of twist in the chain. Check out the reeving. Uh, be sure it's proper. You, you'll, you'll be able to find that out in a frequent inspection by, the, by doing operational checks because the hoist won't be operating right. The hook block will be, will be rotating uh, when it's not supposed to be. And definitely you don't want to have um, a twist in the chain when you reach the top because you could break the chain that way. Okay. So what are we looking for in chain inspections? Interlink wear, nicks, gouges, bent, broken links, heat damage, twisted link struts, corrosion, chemical damage, anything causing us concern. And so these are some examples, some extreme examples. Chain inspections are very subjective. And here we show you some extreme, extreme examples. Um, but sometimes there could be subtle. And if you're in the, in the what I call the shoulders and the interlinks, and the, so if you're seeing any, what, what, what we see, you know, the best thing we can give you for field inspection is if you get your thumbnail in there, and I'm not talking you can feel it, like you can really get your fingernail in there um, on the shoulders, that's pretty much to, to, to us is a reason for uh, rejecting chain. To some it may seem that that's a little bit conservative. Um, we err on the side of caution, and, and we know when we do brake tests on chains um, that they break in the shoulders, you know, even with, with good chain. So if we were to do some type of fatigue test or anything like that, you know, we probably would find out that it would break sooner. Um, 
again, it, could, it can be very subjective. If you're hemming and hawing about it, hey, I don't, I'm not sure, it's probably a good idea to err on the side of conservative and just replace the chain. Okay? And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to sell more chain. That is not it at all. Um, it, I've just seen a lot of things in this industry, and it's better. These are you're lifting a heavy, heavy, heavy loads, and by doing that daily, it seems like these heavy loads aren't that heavy anymore because these machines do it effortless, effortlessly with for us. But trust me, you want to be very, very conservative with chain. And here we're going to show some extremes some load chain inspections. Uh, general surface rust is okay, um, that, but you would definitely, that chain needs lubrication. So if you're running across that, uh, you want to lubricate that chain, we recommend the bar and chain oil. Uh, but something's better than nothing, okay? WD-40 doesn't work that well, but you want to get that oil in the inner links. And if you don't get those inner links oiled up, then this is what happens here, um, which is a bad condition. And we don't, we don't want to see that. And that's from lack of uh, lack of lubrication and it just compounds and when everything starts to compound and gets to this point um, severe internal damage has happened and uh, most likely a break is going to happen but it may not always be this severe um, like I said it could be a, a, a scratch that you can get your fingernail in um, and what I'm talking in, right in this area right in here if you're seeing scratches nicks and gouges in these areas and you can get your fingernail but it's kind of you know it doesn't seem so bad but you're kind of having a haunt about it I would definitely um, take it out of service. And let me get back to presentation mode here. And there you go. So here there's there's what I'm talking about in the links in the right you know any time we have scratches that are at least fingernail deep and it, you know a lot of people ask us well how really deep is that? And really um, it's not practical to measure in the field. Um, and then you can see here any any areas that are, are pulling apart is, is going to break the chain. Um, so we want to take that out of service if we see it in there. Just err on the side of conservative. Oops. After we do a link by link inspection, we want to measure our chain out. You get 12 to 24 inches, take a measurement of it, and then um, you can find a good you can find good lengths of chain in what's known as the the loose end or the dead end of the chain that either sits in the bucket or on a lever tool or where the uh, end stop is located. So that there's where you can find it. You want to take a measurement of that and use the gauge length, inner length to inner length. For manual hoist, then as you go through it, you have to measure the entire length of chain. This is this is what's the difference between a frequent and a periodic inspection. You have to go and do this, so it's very tedious. Um, you got to measure it out. If you're seeing a two and a half percent difference in length from the good measurement of chain, take it out of service. Power electric hoist, one and a half percent difference, take it out of service. Or look in the manuals of that hoist, and it'll give you exactly what those dimensions should be. Um, but you have to go and measure, not just the area that you think you're using, the entire length of chain. So a lot of people try to skimp there and say, you know. Um, so if someone's coming to your facility and saying they're doing periodic inspections, yet you don't see them measuring out chain, they're not doing a good periodic inspection for you, okay? Just operating the chain, or even, even just doing a load, a, load, a load test is not a periodic inspection. Hey, we put a load on there and it held, and that's our periodic inspection. That is not a periodic inspection, all right? It has to be, everything has to be visually looked at externally, and then again, what, what I was talking about earlier, um, you determine whether you need to go further into that unit, and that all you know it doesn't have to be done all the time. Just when you think it needs to be done, um, wear on chain 10% on manual hoist, powered hoist 5% or less, and then, you know so um, it could be one link of wear. Sometimes that happens if you're leaving uh, load suspended on the hoist, and it just happens to be articulating at that point. And again, we re recommend cleaning the chain regularly using a bar and chain oil. You want to get that oil in the inner links. Um, it does you really no good on the outside. The only thing it's doing on the outside is preventing rust. It has to be where there's contact. Think about rubbing your hands together as fast as you can very hard. You won't be able to do that long because it gets hot. Now think of a chain under loaded conditions moving over a lift wheel, um, how hot that chain gets. So imagine what happens without lubrication. So if you can lubricate your chains regularly, you're going to have a long-lasting hoist. And if you have your operators um, inspecting at the same time, it's definitely going to have a long-lasting hoist. Um, and lastly, make sure everything's properly anchored. All right, either it's tied off to the hoist, or you can put an end stop on things. 
and be sure that stuff is on there. We have seen people get injured or killed by not doing that. So very important step to do that and don't overlook it. Okay, so there it is. Yes. Before we go to the questions, I want to have one more polling question to oh, ask great, great. before we wrap up. Okay. So if a hoist is suspected of being overloaded, what should be done immediately? Remove from service and load test the unit to make sure it's safe. Remove from service and do a frequent inspection. Remove from service and perform a periodic inspection or lift only light loads the remainder of the ship. Wow, we've got, oh, uh, okay, we've got some votes coming in. Let's keep going. I'll read it again. If a hoist is suspected of being overloaded, what should be done immediately? Remove from service and load test the unit to make sure it's safe. Remove from service and do a frequent inspection. Remove from service and perform a periodic inspection or lift only light loads the remainder of the shift. It looks like 32% think the first answer. 5% think remove from service and do a frequent inspection. And about 60% think remove from service and perform a periodic inspection. Can you share what the correct answer is, Peter? Yep, you want to remove from service and do a periodic inspection. Um, again, just doing a load test is not really doing much. I mean, I've seen cracked parts and even bad hooks and things of that nature hold up, even when they're load tested, and hold the weight, no problem. Um, so your eyes are much better, um, a visual a much, is a much better inspection, so that's what a, the periodic inspection is. You're going to do a thorough periodic inspection, and again, if you're suspecting an overload situation, you may want to seriously think about um, going through that hoist and dismantling it or, or further evaluating it internal parts, um, depending on what you're finding. Um, like Again, a load test is only verifying that parts are holding but something can still be damaged and, and hold up to a load test. So do a periodic inspection, and um, quite frankly, if, if someone told me they severely overloaded their hoist, I would probably take it apart and look at it internally because there's a lot of load-bearing internal components um, that could shear or uh, be not right internal or the housing can be cracked internally. So I've seen, I've seen it all, and I'm just giving you what, I, what, what my recommendations are. Okay. Peter, uh, two questions were given to us uh, halfway through the webinar, and I had to hold off because I didn't want to slow you down because I know you had a lot to cover. And I realize, everybody, we have about three minutes left, so we're going to make this quick. If you have any questions you would like to ask Peter, feel free to type them in, and he will personally send you an answer after the session. So the first question is, doesn't OSHA refer back to manufacturer's recommendations for inspection and testing requirements? If so, why doesn't CMCO state low test required in instances whenever they state recommended? Um, because it's a, it depends, why, why don't we, a recommendation, um, really sometimes depending on where, how big, you know, the big the equipment is. Now manual hoist and lever tools, yeah, they're small, they're, they're easy to get into a load test machine, they're easy to test. Other hoisting equipment, not so easy and very, very costly to do. Um, is it a great practice? You know, I would love to make it mandatory. Is it going to be practical? Probably not, um, which is why a visual inspection um, should be done. Now, now, you know, most people, you can visually, if you know what you're looking for and you're visually inspecting it, it would be a, a, a safe, safe equipment. I personally... If I visually inspected a hoist or someone told me that and I knew they knew what they were doing, visually inspected a hoist uh, thoroughly and put it back in service without doing a load test versus one that was just load tested and not visually inspected, I would tell you, I, I would tell you right now I would work with the one that was visually inspected way before the one that was load tested because there's things that if you haven't seen it, if you can't see it by doing a load test. Someone can see what's wrong with their eyes, and uh, that, that's my opinion. And I know the, if, if the manufacturer did their load test, those parts are going to hold up. Okay. So um, I don't know if I answered the question, um, but it's, that's why yeah. it's, a, it's a recommendation because it's not practical to make it mandatory. It really isn't. It, would, it, would it be a, mu a much safer world if we did? Absolutely. I agree with that, but it's, it's just not going to practical and it probably wouldn't be done. Okay. Uh, we have one more question, and then uh, we'll wrap up. And I apologize for getting really close to the end. Do you view lever hoist used in pulling conductors up to Sagon Towers, 
different than lifting a load overhead in regards to inspection cycles. Let's see, do you view lever hoist used in pulling uh, conductors up uh, to, it says up to sag on towers different than lifting a load overhead in regards to inspection cycles. Um, the, way I, the, only, the way I can interpret that question, I'm not sure what they're asking, but I think what they're asking is a lever tool being used as a hoist. And yes, a lever tool is a hoist. It can be used just like a, a manual hoist or an electric hoist. If you put enough chain on it and the operator can operate it and raise it a, a big distance, certainly it can be used that way. It has the western type brake and there's no diff, really not much difference between a chain fall and uh, a lever tool. So, But a lever tool requires the same inspections as a chain fall, so nothing would change. Um, you would have to do your periodic inspections on the lever tool just like the chain fall. But yes, both can be used as a lever tool, can be used as a hoist. And, um, and it can be used for pulling, even in pulling operations. Um, so if you're not using it as a hoist and you're using it just for pulling and tensioning, same thing. It's, it's, required, it's required that you do a annual periodic inspection or more, depending on the severity of service. Okay. I've got one I think quick that question. polling question. Frank, if you didn't answer it, uh, if you had something else regarding that question, Go ahead and let me know, and uh, I can forward it to him after the session. But if you could please go ahead and answer this quick poll, we just want to see, based on all the things that you've heard today, are you interested in attending a hoist inspection and maintenance class? If so, just let us know. We, we really appreciate this feedback. Um, yes, you would within one to three months, within three to six months, within six to 12 months, or this isn't something maybe that you're interested in. We just would like to get a little feedback. And we'll leave that to so you. While they're answering that question, um, we have August 12th through 16th, we have a chain and wire rope hoist repair technician certification. So if you want to dive into all kinds of lever tools and chain falls, electric hoist, wire rope hoist, air hoist, um, we do it all in a week, and we do electrical troubleshooting, and it's a great course. And take. where is that one held, Peter? Tonawanda, New York. Tonawanda, and what are the dates again? Well, August 12th to the 16th. And then if you just want to learn more about external inspection with cranes and hoists, it's not a repair school. It's just external inspections, and we're looking, you know, cranes and hoists. It would be August 20th and the 22nd. Why don't you go ahead and pull up those slides? Perfect. Thank you, everybody, who gave us that feedback. We really appreciate it. And then Peter can wrap up here then. Thank you. Yeah. Also, also if you want to learn more about uh, electric hoist inspection, um, we have a Lodestar online training course, which is our electric hoist. Um, it's a great course. It takes about six hours to do, and there's testing questions, and it's very interactive. So if you want to know how to inspect electric, electric hoist and how it works and, and everything about it, take the course. It's, it's very good, very interactive. People are surprised by how interactive it is on an online course. All right. And on that note, Peter, can you just flip to the last slide? Sure. Okay. Um, so again, we want to thank everyone for coming. If you have any last questions, feel free to type them in and we'll capture them. And I just wanted to let you know how you can connect with us. For those of you who would love to read a, a blog article once a week about our industry, our products, application stories, how-to stories, uh, go to our blog, blog at cmworks.com, and you can subscribe there and get a weekly update. We have about 120, 115 articles currently there written by 20 different people within Columbus McKinnon. Um, we have two Twitter accounts, CMCO Live and CM Entertainment. You can find us on Facebook. We have a lot of fun things going on on Facebook page. Um, we love to share pictures, application stories, and like to throw some challenges out every now and then. You can find us on YouTube where we're going to be putting all of our webinar series uh, that we did today and all those from uh, previous months. You can find us on LinkedIn, you can find us on Google+, and we uh, very much encourage you to connect. But without further ado, I'd like to thank you again for, um, for attending today, and you will be receiving a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, and great questions, everyone.